Hello and welcome to this UK Council for Graduate Education webinar on adapting postgraduate education for remote delivery. My name's Owen Gower and I'm the director of the UK Council for Graduate Education. I'll be facilitating this discussion. Thank you to all those who joined us for the first of these webinars last week. You can find a recording of that session on the UK CG YouTube channel. We've structured the discussion today into four sections, which we hope will cover the issues you raised in the Q&A last week. In particular, you asked us for insights and reflections on embedding technology enhanced learning in postgraduate course design. You asked us for some practical case studies and further discussion of what we should be planning for the next academic year. Please use the chat box on Zoom. Uh, in fact, uh, can I just say, please use the Q&A box on Zoom uh, and the comments section in the YouTube channel to raise additional questions as we go along. And I will be posing your questions to the panelists on your behalf. And just a reminder before we begin that the council has published guidance on conducting Vivas online, which you can find on our website. And we're currently working on recommendations for effective remote research supervision. So please just watch our website for further information about that. Uh, and at the council, we're also trying to put our uh, events and other workshops online, including one that we've got programmed for next week on postgraduate researcher employability. Um, so please take a look at that on our website and join us if you can. Right, here are our panelists, and I'm gonna ask them now to introduce themselves. Karen, I wonder if we can start with you. Hi there, uh, my name is Karen Clegg. I head up the Research Excellence Training Team at the University of York. Um, lovely to e-meet you all out there. Um, we provide support for the York Graduate Research School in terms of professional development um, and training for supervisors and for PGR students um, and postdocs more generally. Thank you. Hello, I'm Tim Neumann. I'm a lecturer at the UCL Institute of Education, where I'm also heading the Learning Technologies Unit, and I teach on our online PhD program. Julian, are you there? I think Julian might have joined as an attendee, so maybe if you can come back to him later. Thank you. Uh, in that case, Helen. Hi. Um, sure. I'm Helen Boskatten. I'm academic lead for PGR training in social sciences at the Open University. I'm based within our graduate school, where it's my job to design and uh, and deliver um our pgr uh training curriculum for our doctoral students dom yeah hello i'm uh dominic pates i'm a senior educational technologist at city university of london uh, i manage the relationship between our central educational technology services and uh, three of our schools the business school the law school and the uh, engineering computer science school Nice to see you all again, or here. Uh, hello everyone, my name is George Freyd. I am a digital learning designer at Imperial College London's Graduate School, uh, and I'm also a program leader for research integrity at the Graduate School. And uh, hi, I'm Julian Bream. Uh, I manage the Bloomsbury Learning Exchange, which shares good practice across a number of University of London institutions. Thank you all for joining us. So our first section of, uh, for the discussion is 
the transition to remote learning and postgraduate education. So last week we had a useful discussion, um, but it, it, it was looking at the strategic issues uh, relating to the, the impact of COVID-19 on, on uh, postgraduate provision. Now we want to sort of take a step back and just consider some of the principles involved in good uh, remote delivery of postgraduate education. So we wanted to start with you, Helen. Could you give us your reflections on this? Sure, yeah, we will do. So as I said before, I work at the Open University in our graduate school, um, which might make you think, oh, they've been doing remote postgrad education for ages, which is sort of true and sort of not. What we have got a lot of uh, experience on uh, historically is taught postgraduate, postgraduate stuff. So we've done a lot of master's and MSc uh, stuff online, but we haven't done research degrees. Research degrees have been uh, and remain really the only thing that we do like a traditional university so where we actually have students on campus and, and supervisions uh, uh, you know everything face to face that kind of thing so we we have a lot of infrastructure and there's a lot of pedagogical expertise around online learning in the institution but since the graduate school has been established I think three years now and um, it's been about trying to bring some of that expertise into what we're doing with our postgrads um, to reflect the fact that that, that market's changing and, and that things are moving uh, much more online even prior to COVID. So where we started with this uh, about three years ago was probably more similar to brick universities than, than you might imagine. Um, I came into post in 2016 and the first job really we were um, establishing a graduate school having not had one for a long time and so it was about looking at the doing an audit first of all of what we had across the university so what infrastructure what systems what people what resources um, and then having a look at what was needed in terms of for example funder requirements um, you know what ES, ESRC and the other big funders wanted for um, wanted to be on postgraduate training curriculums there was also a lot of listening to students and thinking about what they want and what they use already and what they feel is missing. We had a really well established uh, and high quality face to face uh, teaching program, but what which worked very well for our full time students, but for our part time students, um, we were, you know, we were aware that they were not getting the same access uh, to provision. And obviously, as academics that don't get to do a lot of face to face teaching, um, academics really enjoy doing face to face sessions. And, and we're really, uh, in some cases, quite resistant to, to making that more remote because it was the one bit of student contact that they got and they, they really enjoyed it. So we started with a kind of a bit of a, a a bit of a hearts and minds, uh, a bit of a hearts and minds mission to sort of persuade people that it that we needed to move um, more online with our postgraduate training provision for the research students. Um, we started with using the program that we had already, and um, just basically adding um, audio recording to that. So we moved to. We move from a, just a straight live session to having um, a facilitator, an extra facilitator in the room to run an Adobe Connect session within the session. Um, and that's still what we're doing uh, for most of our sessions. And we're kind of um, retrofitting um, some of the expertise in the wider institution um, as we go along. Um, it's or it's been one of those kind of a bit like um, a bit like many of you will have been experiencing. It's been that kind of pragmatic thing of okay, we've got new students coming in October. <laughs> it's now March. We need a curriculum. We'll start with what we've got, and and you know we will design it from the ground up later. You know, so that's very much the um, the approach that we've uh, that we've taken, and we're now getting to the point where we're sitting back, sort of two or three years in, and thinking okay, what shape would we actually want this to be if we were designing it from the start? Something that's been really helpful is that we've been introducing um, a set of new professional doctorates um, and those are designed to be done online because they're designed for obviously practitioners um, who are doing doctoral studies part-time. So we've then, we've taken the kind of expertise in designing uh, really good online training and then 
kind of incorporated our you know used our um, existing resources as a basis for that so we're now producing um on stuff that's designed to be delivered on online um but it's been a sort of long and wiggly road to get there so we did start by just doing audio recording um and then as we kind of gained confidence with uh with the tech of it and with how it worked and with how students received it we started to add in video streaming too we upgraded our equipment and got a uh, got a decent camera and a good microphone um and we're now do we're now live streaming um our sessions um this we do this via adobe connect they're stored on an internal site that just the students can access and we can make videos available on a uh, a one by one basis and we can edit things and take out you know we can edit things before we make them available to students but we are finding that students are accessing the session they're really valuing being able to access the sessions remotely they're really enjoying the live stream this and they are they are also accessing them um after the fact as well um so what we're now at the stage of doing is kind of evaluating where we've got to so far and drawing stuff together and starting to decentralize uh face-to-face -face teaching uh for our core training for for uh research students so we're now starting to um review the curriculum that we've put together over the last few years and start to look at using um using the, the establishment of the professional doctorates as a, as a sort of um, engine for this um looking at how we can actually turn this into stuff that that is that is online and that we're not just um we're decentralizing the face-to-facing -face so we're not just sort of saying oh this is happening face-to-face -face. and if you want you can also attend online via this we're looking at how we actually make it you know pedagogically pedagogically sound um online learning um and again it's a process it feels very iterative i think iterative is the word that i would use to sum up how it's been for us is that we've been starting from a quite it's not really a neat start it's been quite a messy start starting from having lots of things already and then moving them around and doing different things with them and now we're trying to sort of connect them all up in a way that makes sense so that we've got a more um uh i guess bespoke tidy uh curriculum that's actually designed to be online rather than just retrofitted as such um Thanks. so that's kind of where we've got to at the ou with our um with our research student core training program so i'd be really interested to hear how that is reflected in other people's experience or what other people have been doing differently and to answer any questions thank you helen Julian, I wonder if I can draw you into this, talking more about accessibility yeah. and how we can think about accessibility when we're kind of designing um, remote delivery. Yes, thank you. I think it's really important that whatever we think about accessibility in the past, now when we're designing delivery, we are really thinking about minimising barriers and challenges for everybody, because we don't know what it's like for people where they're at, and we can do what we can to uh, to remove systemic barriers and in the choices we make. And I just want to quote four simple ideas. And this is from Alastair McNaught, who's built up a great deal of experience with the GIST around accessible practice. And the four principles are is to ensure that all content and communications, for that matter, can be accessed easily, can be navigated effectively, can be consumed comfortably, and can be acted on and responded to seamlessly. So that means whatever we're putting there for people, um, it can be accessed, the systems we use, uh, for example, they can use on different screen sizes with or without a mouse. We don't put over complicated passwords in the way. And the choices tutors make, you know, using really clear instructions, not just scanning a lot of stuff and dumping it online, but crafting it, uh, navigating it. We look at the menus on our systems and also the way documents and materials navigated using headings rather than just sort of italics and bold. So that again, anyone can use a keyboard or navigation tools in a document to go with between sections 
or click here isn't what hyperlinks say, but actually the name of the content. And consuming it comfortably means everybody can adjust the text to the size they like, change the color, uh, the background color. Um, and the, the tutor will write in plain English the tutor can differentiate between what are the basics, introductions, and advanced in a way that, uh, um, given that they're not face to face, and people might be accessing materials in different ways. Remember, there's no printing costs involved here, so they can afford to spread content out, put in more images, make things less text heavy. And crucially, I think for online now, is that students can act on and respond seamlessly um, to demonstrate their learning. At system level, uh, tools can be sort of magnified. But again, the tutor or supervisor, they can look at content. Um, they can create content so that it can be responded to like regularly throughout the session. If the student's consuming it on a phone, rather than write something, can they respond with a video or a podcast? So it's not a hard and fast thing though. I mean, a, a lot of institutions have been very anxious about making all their material accessible. And I think it's important to realize that it is always a trade-off with the tutors you have, the material you have, the tools available. And as long as everyone's doing the best they can, and especially if they have a policy they're working towards, then that's a very defensible and sound place to be coming from. Um, and most importantly, that they're responsive. When they hear an individual student has difficulties, they can pick that up straight away and respond to it. Um, there's more good advice on this from uh, AbilityNet.org UK disk and, and other places. Um, there is a second aspect to this I just wanted to flag up, which is really about well-being and us considering the readiness of students to learn and respond from home and the readiness of tutors and supervisors to deliver. And we're all in the same boat at the moment, so we can put ourselves in their place and think what they need, not just the best of situations, but the most difficult of ones, and really question our assumptions about what we think works. That was a very clear conclusion from um, the research into distance education conference last month at the University of London, was a, a call again to question our assumptions, to re-evaluate our assumptions all the time on what we think is going to work. And I just wanted to quote very briefly from uh, Im Imperial Colleges Graduate School has five top tips. They are to tackle isolation with regular scheduled meetings, help people see faces as often as possible, have formal and informal meetings. The second one is to acknowledge the change everyone's gone through, to enable tutors and supervisors to look at their agreements again, recontract with the students, what will work best for them, how often to meet, where and when, you know, what additional support around feedback or assessment. And uh, maybe consider a, a, like a formal exercise to assess readiness, because as someone at home, there's challenges on their bandwidth, access to uh, the technology. Imagine they've, they've got children suddenly to look after all day or family members with, with needs now. Depending where they live, they might not have access to furniture. You know, be able to sit in the place where they can do it or have the space and the time or the time away from caring to have the peace and quiet. So, a third element to consider is to be careful with our communications, not to overload people. And also when we're asked for help, when tutors are asked, or supervisors are asked for help, 
encourage a coaching approach for people to solve their own problems now that we're remote from their circumstances rather than feel like we will always have the answers but encourage people to find answers to solve and overcome difficulties in terms of delivery scheduling in downtime recognizing and i'm sure this won't be the first time we say this online time is intense we cannot just replicate Julian, I'm, I'm afraid I think you've dropped out there. I suppose that is one of the perils of this Ooh, virtual sorry, environment. I'm back on. Ah, here we are. It's... Hello, <laughs> sorry, I, I lost you there. Uh, I, was, I was saying about how Wi-Fi is difficult. I've got five other people in uh, this where I am hammering the Wi-Fi, and that's why my I keep coming in and out. Uh, and I just wanted to raise a point also about well-being. And I know the UK CG is developing good practice around this, but as to three things, really establish clear roles and visibility of staff, promote student services, mindfulness, chaplaincy, counselling, disability support, anything like that. And two, encourage communities, formal and informal, to enable buddying, peer support. And three, consider tutors and supervisors. They might be having exactly the same trouble as the students. Um, they might not have the circumstances to be able to deliver online. They might have other family members uh, with now increased needs or demands on, on for the equipment. Uh, they might be asked for additional pastoral support to offer. Um, so, to consider it's an anxious time for all of them and especially everyone when they're considering the future of this their impact say financially on their career some people will have trouble with visas and traveling to take all these things into account and there i'll finish what i want to say there because before my bandwidth goes again julian thanks very much and we've just had a question come through the Q&A, um, which is asking specifically about student to student interaction uh, and collaborative learning, especially in the seminars. I don't know whether, Don, can you say anything about, about effective practices to encourage student to student interaction? Uh, let me see what I can uh, see what I can say there. Uh, yeah, I, I think with with all things, the setting of clear expectations is one of the key things here. But see, the affordances of the particular platform or the technology that is being used is uh, is important. You know, wh whether there is uh, sort of interaction capabilities designed in, as there are um, with a platform like like Zoom that we're on uh, at the moment, for example. But um, one of the things that, um, uh, for example, um, none of us are in the same room where we would normally be uh, as uh, panelists in a live event, but um, the expectations have been set with us uh, uh, already that we do things like we use the raise hand function um, and uh, we, we sort of keep an eye on the other communications channels as well. So I think um, prior to the actual uh, synchronous event, if that's what is uh, is happening, I think setting clear expectations around and looking at the affordances of the tool itself uh, uh, are quite important for um, encouraging student to student interaction. Um, one of the other things I suppose as well from, uh, from a staff point of view is uh, probably also to recognize and accept that students will often al always find their own ways two um, so uh, for example if they find if they find that there is uh, that they'll use whatever the tools are are on hand and they'll tend to self-organize for that it might be that they'll find a facebook group or a whatsapp group or something particularly if there are no interaction uh, capabilities that are uh, that are already sort of designed in Don, thanks i want to move now to the first of our case studies um, and this is really uh, an opportunity for Tim to tell us a bit more about 
particular research skill module um, that he's developed and, and, and produced. Tim, I wonder if we can hand to you. Thank you, yes. Hello, everybody. Um, I, before I start with the case study itself, um, let me quickly address uh, the, the issues that Julian and Dom have just uh, raised with regards to accessibility and also interaction. Um, accessibility, thanks to the changes in legislation, should be on every university's agenda now. So the university should have developed some plan for that. And uh, you should find some guidance uh, in, in the relative um, on the respective department. So at UCL, we have done this in um, pretty big style and have developed some um, guidance at multiple levels. But first and foremost, um, there was an earlier question about how to gauge students' needs. Um, and uh, in response to that, if students are really uh, impaired and have declared their impairments, then you should have a SORA, some sort of um, plan in place uh, so that tutors know about this and then can make some uh, provisions. But other than that, you have to ask people and part of that uh, can be included in the course design. So when you're starting a module or a unit or a training program, you can just ask your students uh, whether there are any issues uh, that the tutor needs to take into account like time zones or um, are they now at home look, uh, caring for somebody and so on? Um, and then hopefully you can be flexible enough to make some adjustments. However, adjustments obviously for practical reasons uh, have some limitations. Um, in terms of interaction, we can perhaps see in the case study uh, a potential plan on how to address this. So for that, let me share the screen. In terms of online research training at the UCL Institute of Education, we perhaps have a bit of a head start because we started an online PhD program in 2015. So that is uh, 20. 15, yes, that's five years ago. And even before that, uh, we, uh, when I joined the Institute of Education back in 2005, I quickly was involved in getting our student-led research journal, Educate, um, online. Uh, so this is now a fully online journal where PGR students are on the editorial board and the training to become a journal editor, the training to write articles for this journey, journal and the training to review articles has been delivered online since I think it was 2007, so for quite some time. And it has quickly become part of the research training program for all of our doctoral students. There were face-to-face -face courses, but also online courses because we um, had uh, since, I don't know, 2003 or maybe earlier a professional doctorate degree where students were only asked to attend one week per term. Um, so very limited face-to-face -face time. And, and for these students, we have developed online trainings. So uh, as I mentioned, we had a bit of a head start, but I want to present this module here, Writing and Presenting Education Research, which is part of the online PhD research training program. It's a small unit only. Um, and I think it's not mandatory, but uh, it, represents the type of trainings we run online. So you could replace the title with uh, quantitative research skills training or qualitative research skills or anything else, which is part of the re research skills training. It's just that I am teaching this unit, so I'm most familiar with this. So uh, what we see here is Moodle. So our virtual learning environment is based on Moodle. And just to take one anxiety away from all of you, this looks really bland. So you don't need to produce anything uh, super visual and super uh, bells and whistle stuff. Uh, it, it's not really so much how attractive things look, but how engaging the activities are. Having said that, even though it might look bland, there has been quite a bit of thought put into the design of this module. It is reduced with a purpose in order 
to what Julian has mentioned, not to overwhelm students with too much information, addressing the cognitive load issue, um, and also uh, addressing other pedagogical principles. I can talk about pedagogical principles for hours because that's my background, um, but uh, I won't. I will refer you to other tips there instead. So we only have um, very limited information on the front screen, and then we have three activities in this module. This module runs for four weeks, and in this four weeks we do four activities, uh, three activities, sorry. And these activities take at least two weeks. So uh, the first one takes two weeks and it's about analyzing um, uh, presentation to uh, learn how to critique presentations. And then the second activity is three weeks to create a presentation and even present online. So that students get this presentation experience. And the third activity is uh, for two weeks to review uh, the peer uh, presentations. Uh, but in order to review, we need to think about evaluation criteria, and that gets people into the critical thinking mindset, hopefully, in order to think about what is uh, what is it actually that I need to look at when I'm looking at presentations. So we do things mostly with the help of discussion forums. So for each activity, we have a description which really lays out in pretty great detail what students are expected to do. That goes back to Julian's point about setting expectations and really making it clear what students should be doing. So if you are spending time on something, then I would really suggest to spend time on writing clear and good instructions. Uh, so what I'm asking my students here is to pick a presentation from the web wherever they can find it, YouTube or elsewhere, and then uh, critique the presentation according to some suggested criteria, just to get a bit of critical thinking going. And then as a second part, um, there should be some feedback and some discussions. And that is actually the reason why we are taking more than one week for each activity. Because online, when people are not uh, online at the same time and meeting uh, each other at the same time, discussions need time to develop because people are doing it in their own time. So spread out your activities over a certain time frame. And then uh, what you're probably more interested in, how do I run presentations online? This is the core part of this module, the capstone activity where students pre prepare presentation and then uh, present it online. And the activity here um, suggests that students can choose one particular context, a type of setting that their presentation should uh, be situated in, can be a conference presentation, poster presentation, research funding pitch, introduction to friends and family to a lay audience and so on. So, uh, so I want to uh, get PGR students to think about their audience really and really target their presentation towards this particular audience. And then some tips what the presentation should include and what outputs they will need the presentation aids like slide sets, posters, infographics and so on. And then once that, so they need to prepare an artifact and once they've done this, they need to present as well. But when we are online, some people might have real difficulties jumping into a web conference at a particular time. So I tend to be very flexible. I schedule multiple opportunities at different times and we run a doodle poll to find out when people could deliver their presentation live in a web conference. However, even that might not capture everybody. So I give people the option to run their presentation in a recorded way. And I give them a few tips on how to do this. For example, using PowerPoints included recording facilities and then just upload the whole thing. And I'm managing this whole activity like a proper conference. So we have a proceedings database where students are submitting um, their entry like in a conference, they need to give it a title, classify their context and uh, how they want to present it. And then they need to submit an abstract and upload their um, artifact, although this can be at a later point. And then what we will then get 
is a nice little database. I've redacted the names of the students. This is from a live course where you could then link through the abstract. And then once students have done the recording, the live presentation, which has been recorded, or once uh, students have recorded themselves somehow asynchronously, then we'll get a link to that recording that people can view. And then they can also leave comments in order to have a discussion and you do the Q&A online. And that works pretty successfully, I have to say. Um, this course uh, did not have many responses because we only had a small cohort of, I think it was six students in there. Um, and finally, I uh, get them to review the whole set of presentations according to certain criteria. And for that, I'm using Padlet as a tool to get some evaluation criteria together. So some students really went uh, all out here and develop the proper marking rubric um, with uh, criteria and different levels. But I also put up the three minute thesis presentation, which is this nationwide competition that runs because we can use this module to prepare students for the three minute thesis competition. And at UCL IOE, we even were accepting online presentations for this competition. So I want to close off uh, with two things. One, um, Julian mentioned the importance of seeing the face. For that purpose, I start every module with an introductory video, which in this case I've run it as a web conference. And there students are then seeing my face and they see me talking uh, uh, at some point. Now that is, hasn't high production values, but it sets, sets the social presence and if you know of the communities on, of inquiry framework that's a very simple concept um, that helps you think about what elements you need to have and balance in order to get a good educational experience. So I want to finish off by pointing out some tips and tricks that you may like which are valid for PGT as well as PGR. So just over the past few weeks in the frenzy of getting stuff together I have actually been uh, creating some drop-in sessions for UCL where we were talking through some practical online teaching tips and some of the things I've mentioned here will reappear in these short 50 to 20 minute sessions, uh, recordings here. And um, currently we have uh, seven episodes online or 6.5 and two more are forthcoming shortly and they are available at this URL. L, which we, I'm sure, can also paste in the text chat once someone else has taken over my screen again. And I think I should stop here. Tim, thank you very much indeed. Um, that was very helpful, very in informative, and I have to say a very, very humble too. Thank you. I want to move um, on now to the second of our case studies, and this one is being led by Karen. Karen, over to you. Hi there, everybody. Um, I'm hoping that means that uh, you can you can hear me. Owen, can you confirm I'm audible? Yes, you're all there. Lovely, perfect. Um, in which case, Owen's asked me to speak a little bit about uh, an online tutorial that we've spent probably the last eight, 10 months developing and which, um, you know, in, in the light of the current uh, situation in which we all find ourselves, could not have been more perfectly timed. Um, it's, we, we've not been um, previously great at, uh, or, or rather effusive in terms of the way of, that we present online um, like in many universities, we've relied on quite a lot of face-to-face -face training um, and sort of, I suppose, sensing that we had a, an amount of commuters and obviously distance learners. We developed this um, as an online way of, of supporting predominantly supervisors. So this is a, a, a different take, I suppose, is the, the flip side of the coin. Um, I'm going to take you through it very briefly just to give you a, a sense of what it looks like. Um, so I'm going to share. Uh, I'm going to share my screen with you. So hopefully that means you can all see 
um, the being an effective supervisor tutorial screen now. It's very strange not having people coming back and saying, yes, I can see it, but- no, I'm afraid Wilbur. we can't. You can't, hang on. No. You can't, because I haven't clicked share. Perfect, thank you, Karen. <laughs> You see, this this just shows that how human you've got to be. And it was one of the things I've been thinking as I've been listening to other people speaking is, um, you know, we have to be a bit brave, I think, or braver um, as educational developers and as, as researcher developers in just being able to um, experiment and use the gift uh, of time that we've been given if we want to see it positively to have a go at new stuff. Um, and that means getting things wrong publicly occasionally, um, which perhaps we're not all comfortable with, but nonetheless, you can now see the screen. So um, BEST, being an effective supervisor tutorial, um, is a complementary online tutorial um, for the University of York supervisors. And it complements our being an effective researcher tutorial, which is effectively an online um, induction and set of resources and links to support at the university and more widely. Um, for the technical information amongst you, it was created using Xerti, um, which I gather from my colleagues um, is pretty easy to use. But my recommendation, I think, would be use whatever platform you've got, use uh, whatever technology is available to you at your universities and where you've got support um, from your IT folk. But I'm not suggesting that anybody creates this in the next couple of weeks, but I'll try and give you an overview of, of what it does to, um, to give you some, some maybe thoughts and tips. So the, the screen that you can see in front of you gives you a little bit about how to navigate the colours, altering the text size, etc. Um, and then we go through the, the general introduction, uh, which gives some background as to, as to what this does. This is now available um, on our learning management system. So it's available to, uh, to all staff. That includes um, research administrators in departments. And so gives them some background as to how they might also support the supervisory experience. Um, and it goes through a number of different, uh, a number of different sections. The first one that I want to flag up is that uh, we started building the programme last year at about the same time as we were piloting the UKCGE supervision recognition programme. And so we've been able to draw on our experience of supporting supervisors through that process and then refine um, the, the outline and the framework for the tutorial around the, the 10 uh, criterion for good supervisory practice. So in due course, as we're going to go through um, supporting academics through, through the recognition programme, it also means that this set of support aligns to those, to those criteria, which was uh, in some ways uh, fortuitous and, and accidental, and in other ways um, was, was a, a design decision that we took um, late on when it appeared that the, the two areas um, so how to support supervisors obviously mapped really nicely to those criteria and so uh, that's there for you to give some thought to uh, perhaps how you might want to design support for supervisors and the areas that they might be tackling particularly at the moment um, in the, the situation that we find ourselves so it's in six sections at the moment. Um, as I say, all of them then are mapped to those 10 criteria. So we start uh, at the start with the, the process, the regulations, the policy, the progression. And obviously they, they would have to, uh, to link and speak to your own institutional policies if you wanted to develop something similar. Um, we'll all have something very similar, I'm sure, in terms of policies for research students, but, um, but they will differ. Then there are approaches to supervision and building effective relationships. And there we've, uh, you know, we've plagiarized um, a, a joke, of course, that with complete reference, um, we've taken pedagogy, we've taken literature. Um, I know Stan Taylor's uh, out there in the ether listening. So Stan, huge thanks to all the work that, um, that you've done then to which we've made reference in here. Section on supporting uh, student welfare and I echo um, what's been said previously in this respect in that 
the community building um, is really important. And I'll say something more about that uh, in a moment when I take you through that section. Section on information, digital and writing skills, um, as you might imagine, one on professional development and careers, uh, and a final one on completing the PhD. Again, I'll say uh, a few more words about that um, when we get there in the light of, uh, of COVID-19. So the, the policy section, as I say, I'll just skim through because this would need to align with your own institutional practices. Um, obviously, we all have a, a, a common criteria in an original contribution to knowledge for a PhD research awarded, um, but our other practices are going to be institutionally different. So this takes us to our policy um, and to our principles on supervision code, etc and the timelines, again, um, different timelines. So for those of you who were asking um, through the chat feature whether this was applicable to postgraduate taught, um, the answer is some of it, um, it's aimed at PGRs, but much of this will be applicable also to PGT. And I think the principles of supervision um, and the pedagogy that's referenced there will, will definitely um, be of, of use to, to PGT supervisors. Areas here around recruitment and selection. Um, and here, we, as I say, we've linked to the UKCGE guidance and, uh, and their, the criterion for the recognition programme. PGE induction, this gives some sense of, uh, of induction uh, and again references uh, the, the, the way in which you might approach a supervisory meeting. I should say these are all internal photographs. Obviously, you can uh, you can raid your own resource bank and image bank um, for something applicable should you want to go down down this route. Um, many of you, I'm sure, will have your own institutional or bought in packages um, for supporting PGR students and the research process. Ours is SkillsForge, which uh, is a York designed uh, platform. Uh, and, and monitoring and, and booking for professional development tool. Um, it is commercially available, but this isn't, <laughs> isn't a plug for them. Um, there are many other, other tools out there. So again, all the process, I'm not gonna go through this, but hopefully you'll see some things in here that, um, that chime with your own experiences about the formal reviews of progress, et cetera. Um, and how that's approached. So in terms of, of, of approaches to supervision and building effective relationships, what we wanted to do here um, is to focus really about that, that uh, relationship and how you can build up um, you know, effective relationships that enable students to feel both supported um, for the institution to support and demonstrate their duty of care and to enable uh, progression uh, as easy as possible. So here there are some here there are some opportunities for uh, for supervisors to, to think uh, for themselves and, and reflect on their own experience. And again, should the supervisors want to consider going through the supervisory recognition scheme, um, effectively, what this does is provide uh, a, a, a reflection on practice. I'm going to turn my phone off, apologies for that. Um, so we've got some, uh, some case study examples. Um, and here I have to thank uh, Imperial College, who provided us with the template for some of these um, that, that we uh, we used and we modified and effectively it gets our supervisors thinking about the kind of situations that they might find themselves in and what they might do as a result. Um, again, different thoughts about how, how supervisors might approach and we found that this works really well in face to face training um, and there's no reason at all why, why this isn't enabled online and where people have got a little bit more time to think through uh, their responses and how they might um, consider that. I'm aware of time, so I'm going to flick through this, but it will give you a sense of where some of these articles came from. Much of it is UKCGE. Um, Kay Gachoni has done, done some, some super research um, also um, where we've, we've identified those. 
So process of, of coaching was spoken about earlier, about principles of supervision, how you maintain that relationship. And, and I think at the moment, more than ever, keeping those lines of communication open, seeing students face-to-face -face online, uh, maybe talking to them on the phone and, and taking uh, you know, a physical walk around the garden or around the house with your students um, maybe is, is a way of, of diverting away from many hours in front of, uh, in front of a Zoom or Google Hangout screen, um, making sure that students have the opportunity to clarify and ask questions about institutional approaches um, and their own situations. So supporting different, uh, different groups, we've got some information on that also. I'm going to skim forward here rather than take you through um, every section. So you can navigate this um, reasonably well. In terms of um, researching student welfare, again, we have some common challenges. Um, what's available at the University of York. I will touch on the PhD survival project um, very briefly because this is a peer-to-peer -peer led project that we've had running for a couple of years. It, it was spearheaded by one of our PGR students um, and has now been taken on by, by another group of students. They developed this very nice booklet, which, um, which we print and we have published for them about how to get, uh, get through. It's called the surviving uh, and enjoying your PhD at the moment um, because of sensitivities we're, we're using surviving and thriving um, simultaneously um, as, as ways of recognising that people are going through uh, particular periods of, of anxiety and, and stress. But what this project does is bring students together. Um, last week for the first time, one of their projects was, uh, was online and that was about working uh, with public engagement and getting involved in public engagement. But they do a how to survive your PhD, how to survive your Viva, how to survive field work, how to survive your PhD um, as a, uh, in terms of, of conducting field work, et cetera. And that's entirely peer-to-peer -peer led and, and we survive. The, um, the other things that I can direct you to um, that may be of interest are things like completing the PhD. Now, um, through good luck rather than good management, I'll, I'll be honest, um, we hadn't included too much information here on the actual Viva process, which is fortuitous because um, like many of your institutions, I'm sure you've now had to develop uh, quite quickly uh, some guidelines around conducting online vivas. Um, that's something that we've been doing over the last few weeks and is now available um, on our web pages. So um, we've just redirected the information around preparing for the viva to those pages um, for supervisors and for students to identify what it is that they need to do differently in preparing for the viva. We're also um, providing the preparing for your Viva training, which uh, myself and my team offer, and we're running that online as well. Um, and we've opened that out to research administrators because we know they're key to supporting students and supervisors um, and those who are acting as internal examiners uh, through the process. So we've opened up that training to pretty much anybody involved with the research um, experience uh, who might be there to support their students through, through that particular period. Um, and I think that that takes us to, to the end in terms of links and, uh, and resources that, that we're able to, to offer there. I think those are all the points I wanted to make. Um, I'm very happy to, to take questions as directed by Owen, but I will shut up now. Thank you. That was so helpful. Thank you very much indeed. I'm going to move on now to the final section of today's webinar. And this is uh, really uh, five minutes, George, for you to sum up what you think the future may hold. So George, can I ask you to look into your crystal ball and tell us uh, about why it won't be back to business as usual in 2020 to 21 academic year? I'll do my best. Uh, thank you very much, Owen. Um, it's less trying to predict the future and more 
looking at what's happening now uh, and trying to prepare uh, to meet uh, maybe next academic year students and then looking a bit further ahead uh, because as, as everyone that works in online or distance learning or blended learning or e-learning in general will know that uh, you can do a lot of things quickly uh, but uh, for, for quality you need time to plan and put things in place and some of these plans are very time and resource consuming. Um, hopefully looking ahead will help uh, people that come came to this webinar to align um, some of these thoughts with their own strategies and, and, and plans uh, and sort of identify that the tension that uh, the, the sector is uh, uh, under now uh, is is not um, unknown uh, and and for people working in technology enhanced learning might even be familiar uh, um, so the ways forward uh, might already be there and we just have to sort of uh, try to align with that um, I will just very quickly look into what happened over the last month and then try to look at least up until the next academic year in, in, in terms of what I've been seeing, in terms of the conversations I've been having, uh, in terms of uh, planning for the future. So uh, I think over the past month, uh, we've seen uh, a sort of unprecedented uh, speed in, in adopting technology enhanced learning to, uh, to deliver teaching and learning activities. Uh, this has allowed us to finish the academic year uh, and I think a lot of the issues that e-learning has, has has been meeting over over you know, many many years now uh, seem to all of a sudden disappear, and and we've seen synergies and collaboration and change and barriers uh, disappearing uh, and uh, an acceleration. Um, a lot of that initial movement over the the first couple of weeks after university closed uh, were sort of a like for like replacement. Uh, with a lot of synchronous activities. And if you look at the statistics uh, of, of published by Zoom, Adobe Connect and Teams, you'll see an explosion of, of, of meetings and, and sort of live sessions that happened across the sector. Uh, funnily enough, a lot of these players like Microsoft and Zoom are predicting that come next academic year, this uh, will decrease tremendously, um, uh, not to the levels of before, uh, the the, uh, the the closing of a lot of face-to-face -face teaching, but uh, definitely be reduced, which is interesting. I think that is because people are starting to think more strategically and are putting plans in place for next academic year with a focus more around um, synchronous and asynchronous teaching and effective assessment planning. So I think looking ahead, um, I think the sector is, is looking at two major things. And the first one is external factors. Um, we don't know if the next academic year, uh, if the return uh, to normality won't have to be phased and won't happen over a long period of time. So if there's a, a phased return, um, it might be that we're in a, a situation where teaching resumes um, but certain sectors, certain practices uh, are not fully open yet. So we need to be prepared for that. We also need to be prepared for the possibility that certain sectors of society and, and, and universities as well might have to open and close uh, part of their, their functions um, in, in depending on external factors. It might be that something will need to close with, within a week or two weeks if, if we see another peak. Uh, and then we need to be prepared to, to, to do that. I think the sector is also looking at students' behavior and, and trying to predict how keen international in-home students will be to join university life, to start a new course, especially at postgraduate level. Um, and if they are, what their expectations are in terms of technology enhanced learning, because I think everyone will agree that whatever happens next academic year, the student experience will have to be more carefully planned and better than what happened with uh, less than a week of, of preparation. Um, in terms of a strategy and 
things that we can put in place to prepare for the future. I think every, people that have been working in technology enhanced learning uh, will, will not be strangers to, to seeing this tension that it's, we put a lot of time and energy into going from a situation where there's very little uh, uh, technology enhanced learning uh, in blended learning and distance learning. Um, and that is a first great step, but the second step, which is from having something in place into uh, building something that is scalable, research informed, quality assured, um, with, with proper staff development, uh, student development, etc. That step is much, much harder to take. So if we are planning for the next academic year in the future, there are things that we will need to put in place and questions that we'll need to answer relatively quickly. And, and one of them is, what do we want to communicate to our postgraduate students over the next month or so in terms of the next academic year? I mean, they are thinking, they are in doubt. Uh, what are we telling them uh, relatively shortly in terms of uh, this is what you can expect? Um, one of the major tools that we have, uh, because the academic calendar is, is sort of fairly structured, so things should happen uh, around a certain timeline. And one of the major tools that we have are the onboarding and inductions. So how are we planning for those? Uh, knowing that there are unknowns, knowing that uh, we need to prepare for the possibility of remote teaching, and how are we building these inductions um, to make sure that student skills and student expectations um, are met and that students are ready to join us for blended or distance learning. Uh, I think another major question that people are probably working uh, now to answer is how are we building assessment that we can de deliver effectively and fairly? Uh, we don't want to be caught in a position where uh, we plan for something that we can't deliver and then we try to replace it with something that might not be as pedagogically sound uh, as uh, we could. Um, and then the other question that we need to address is in terms of staff development. I saw a tremendous amount of training going out and resources being collated. Most of them were around uh, tools that you could use and the how-to guides and the videos, which it's common in this first stage, especially when a lot of novices join uh, and adopt a certain type of tool in practice. But how are we addressing the need for academics and teaching staff to be able to course design, do assessment design, and do effective facilitation um, uh, using technology enhanced learning? How are we training our staff to be able to, to do this? So the only recommendations I could give, uh, because we don't know what's happening, and um, are three, really. Uh, the first one, I think, is to uh, embrace true blended learning. Either if that means synchronous and asynchronous, face-to-face -face and online, um, if you are teaching staff, embrace it. Uh, be able to design and develop and facilitate and assess using the variety of strategies that blended learning demands. My second recommendation looking ahead to prepare for the future would be that we need to be able to evaluate success uh, at the next stage as being able to engage students via active learning, engage students and promote distributed practice so that they engage with each other with the materials and with uh, teaching staff at the right times and levels. And then, fairly, uh, and then finally, engage with fair and pedagogically sound assessment practices. And we need to prepare for that, all three. And then finally, I think, and this tends to be overlooked, identify the particular needs students might have in terms of their online learning readiness. Can they communicate online with their peers? Can they communicate effectively with teaching staff? Are they self-regulated uh, in terms of how much they can study and how much they need to do? Um, do they have the 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 uh, ICT proficiency, do they have the digital capabilities, and prepare for that uh, from the induction stage onward and in terms of how you design uh, your courses going forward. Because whatever happens if students don't have the necessary skills to engage with teaching over a long period of time effectively, uh, they will suffer. And we are in a position now to prepare and prevent that and give them a very positive experience. And with that, um, I will stop. Very happy to answer any questions you might have. 
George and all of our panelists, I can't thank you enough for, for giving us your time and your insights um, today. I know that there have been a, a, at least 100 uh, viewers on the Zoom platform and then more on our YouTube as well. So thank you so much. I need to call it a day there, having promised that we would only go on for an hour. Um, so thank you all very much. Please do stay, stay in touch with the UKCG if we can convene further meetings for you. Uh, on particular subjects, please let us know. And in the meantime, I wish you all the very best. Thank you very much.